Hi, I can see there's a few people that have joined us um, and I would imagine a few more people might join as we go along. Uh, so welcome to uh, this webinar this evening called Ask the Vet. Um, we are uh, very pleased to have you here this evening and we hope you enjoy it. It's going to be recorded and it will be shared on social media. So hopefully you'll be able to watch it there or share it for your friends to see if you enjoy it. Uh, I've got the easy job this evening. Um, I'm just introducing our chairperson uh, this evening, who is Emma Cooper, um, and she's going to take over and tell you a bit about herself and uh, then introduce you to the other speakers. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. So um, thanks for fans. So I'm Emma. Um, I, um, I started my career here at Ben actually um, in 2006 as an intern. Um, then went to Australia and um, got more keen on the stud side. So I then spent around eight years down at a practice in Hampshire at Endells and returned here in 2016 to head up the stud side of the practice. Um, since then, I've had two children, I've got Ewan and Poppy, and um, I'm now back from maternity and I'm heading up the ambulatory side. Um, so tonight, um, I'm going to be the one asking our three lovely vets the questions, and I'm really pleased to be joined by Tim, Evita and Amy. Um, what I would say is that everybody can ask questions in our Q&A boxes below, um, so feel free to ask any questions that you particularly want. Um, but we'll just introduce the vets first, so um, Amy. Hello, um, so I'm Amy. I graduated in 2014 from Bristol University. Um, I then did an equine internship in Devon. Um, then moved to the New Forest for a few years where I have grew to love donkeys and ponies of native breeds. Um, then moved home to Sussex for a couple of years and then moved to Bell Equine last year. So I've covered the south of England in um, my equine practice. <laughs> um, really enjoyed moving to Kent and getting to know the lovely team at Bell. You truly are a really, really great team. So really happy to be here this evening. Um, and now I'll Hand back to Emma, introduce Tim and Evita. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, so we also have um, Evita, he's one of our surgeons. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so I graduated, I'm Dutch, so I graduated from Utrecht University in 2002, which seems a long time ago now. Um, and then I spent a bit of time in practice, and then I went to the United States for five years total to do an internship and a residency there, and then became... Um, a boarded surgeon in 2009. So I've been doing um, a surgery since then. Um, in 2009, 10, I went back to the Netherlands. I spent a bit of time in a private practice there. Um, and then after that, I moved on to the University of Bristol. So I started there in 2011 and I spent about seven years there um, in the clinic um, and also got my sports medicine um, diplomacy there. So, um, and I started here at Bell in 2018. So I've been here now for three years and a bit. Um, and my main interests are orthopedics and surgery and sports medicine. So that's kind of the field that I do most of the work in. Thanks, Evita, that's great. And last but not least, we have Tim Mayer. Hi, yeah, I'm Tim. So I'm also a Bristol graduate. But a long time ago, I've worked at Bell for close on 30 years, um, and I'm hospital-based primarily. I'm, I'm, I think I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. I can turn my hand to most things, but my main interests now are in, in medicine and soft tissue surgery and imaging. But yeah, I can, uh, I've done most things during my career, so I can <laughs> turn my hand to lots of things. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. So um, we've had um, a few questions submitted before, so we'll get started with those. Um, perhaps, Tim, um, so one question is, more and more yards are asking owners to test their horses for strangles before they are moved to a new yard. Please, can you explain the process that has to be followed if the test comes back as positive? Sure. So I, I guess this is relating to the, the blood test, the ELISA test that lo looks yep. for antibodies for strangles bacteria. Um, so the, the, the idea behind this would be that if a horse has had strangles recently or potentially could be carrying strangles, then it would have a high antibody level in its blood. So you could pick that up on a blood test. And then if the horse isn't showing any sy symptoms of strangles or hasn't 
known to have had strangles in the in the recent past, it raises a suspicion that maybe this horse is a carrier for the bacteria that causes strangles. And the strangles bug is called Streptococcus equi, and it can live in part of the respiratory tract called the guttural pouch. Uh, and some horses, a small percentage of horses that have strangles will become carriers of, of the bug, which means they may show no symptoms whatsoever. They recover from the, the uh, acute strangles disease, but they carry the infection around with them. So if they go to a new yard, they could potentially carry the bug with them and infect other horses in that yard. So the idea is that you try and detect these horses before they get to the yard. And if, if it comes up with a positive result, then as I say, it may be that that horse could be a carrier. Now, the, if, if you get a positive result, um, then either the horse has had its strangles recently or it could be a carrier. And the only way you can prove that it's a carrier is to take a sample from the guttural pouch, which we do via an endoscope. So the horse would have to have an endoscope passed up its nose and then the endoscope's pushed into the guttural pouch. There's two pouches, one on each side, and we can take samples from that uh, and then see whether the, the, that's actually got the bug in there or not. And if it has, then you can treat it. So that's the purpose of the test. The problem with the test, and it is a little bit controversial, is that we get false negatives. So in other words, if you get a positive result, then it probably means the horse has either met strangles recently or could be a carrier. But a proportion of horses that are carriers will come back with a negative result. So if you get a negative result, you can't be absolutely 100% sure that the horse is not a carrier. It reduces the risk, but it doesn't eliminate the risk. And that is the problem with this test. And that's why it's a little bit controversial. The only way you can prove a horse has got strangles as a carrier or not is to do the endoscopy and take the sample from the guttural pouch. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And so I suppose leading on from that, here's a question for Amy. If you're um, a, um, a manager of a large livery yard, how should you isolate new horses and how long for? Yeah, so generally, ideally, we'd recommend isolating new horses for at least two weeks, but preferably up to three weeks. And the isolation stable should be away from the other horses. Um, other horses shouldn't be walking past the door. They shouldn't be able to kind of come into contact with the horses that are already present on the yard. Um, and an element of biosecurity is advised. So having some sort of fencing around so people can't just go and walk up to the horse and some signs saying this horse is in isolation. I know it can look a little bit intimidating sometimes and to other people on the yard, but I hope most people who have horses on busy livery yards would just appreciate that the yard manager is doing a great job of protecting their horses from different diseases, because strangles isn't the only one. There's flu and there's herpes. So the idea of three weeks or 21 days is that most diseases would start to show um, some kind of signs um, by that stage. So we can identify if the horse is becoming unwell. We could come out and run the appropriate tests um, but yes, I think just generally some really good practice would be uh, keep the horse separate, make sure members of staff, if you have staff or if it's owned by a particular individual, to stick to just looking after that horse on its own and not going from that horse back to the main yard and vice versa and not sharing equipment, water buckets, feeding buckets. Um, so just being quite careful. And if there's no symptoms after a few weeks and, and you're happy. Um, then I think it's safe then to introduce them to the herd because it can be quite hard retrospectively if a couple of weeks down the line and they come out with a snotty nose and they've been out in the whole herd of horses. Um, so people will definitely thank you for it, I think, down the line. Um, once they've, you know, if they have been clear for three weeks, we can all be a bit more confident. Thank you. And, and leading on from that, there's a question about um, vaccines, potentially you could answer too. So um, someone has asked, I hear that the vaccine courses are going to be changing come January. Could you explain yes. that? <laughs> so the BHA, the British Horse Racing Authority, are changing the vaccine schedule next year for racehorses. Um, so it's going from, it was 21 to 92 days. It's changing from 21 to 60 days between the first and second jab. And then it's changing from um, between 100 and, well, as we can say 150 to 180 days for the third one. Um, so 
as far as we're aware, that's for racing at the moment, but we will try to ensure that people get reminders between that window. So we're looking at about four to six weeks for the second jab, which I think generally is what everybody does anyway. Um, and then it's about six months for the third one. Um, in terms of going over, if they're not competing, so elderly horses that on retirement livery, we don't get too worried if they're a week or two over. Um, still good to keep up with their boosters because they are older and might be more immunocompromised than some of the younger horses and um, if they are competing then it's also worth checking with whatever competition authority you compete with if they start to follow suit with bha which is quite likely i don't know if tim has any further thoughts on that <laughs> <laughs> i think it's quite likely that everyone will follow suit and um, but we'll change our reminders I believe yeah. to meet the requirements for everybody <laughs> yeah yes yeah, so we'll be changing reminders shortly so they've been starting to come out and <laughs> um, Evita here's one um, which has come up as well uh, best way to manage cellulitis my horse has had it for over three months and it's just coming to the end of it that's a much more difficult question than it seems <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so it depends on a lot of factors that can be involved. So it depends on what might be causing the cellulitis. So sometimes, um, especially if horses are being kept in like um, muddy environments or when the weather changes, they get past and dermatitis or little wounds and scabs that they get. And that kind of initiates the cellulitis. Usually that is a bacterial component to that. So most of these horses would have to be treated with antibiotics to try to get the swelling and the infection under control. Um, not all of them would fit that category. There would be a significant number of horses that even when you have the infection under control, that there is a compromise in the drainage of the fluid from the leg. Um, and it's very tricky sometimes to get that functioning, to get that system functioning again, especially if it's been a longer period of time. So things to help getting the drainage of the fluid from the leg would be exercise, so to walk these horses frequently, to not put them in a box. Um, sometimes pressure would help as well, so bandaging, stable bandages, anything like that to kind of push the fluid up and away from the leg. Um, in the initial stages, you can use anti-inflammatories, but as you get to a more chronic stage, when the horse's leg is usually not painful anymore, but it's just swollen, it gets very tricky to actually get that swelling to come down. And it might be that you're left with a horse with a chronically swollen leg. And it might not bother the horse um, in a sense that it might not cause any lameness, but it, it does create a cosmetic appearance that is not that pleasurable because if they have a very swollen leg then it seems like there's a lot of things wrong um, and a lot of horses that once they've had cellulitis and they don't recover fully from it are much more prone to get an active form again so to get a bacterial infection again and to become lame again and to get infected again so it's not a straightforward question to answer because it depends on a lot of factors and how where you are with the horse and how comfortable it is. But unfortunately, the bottom line is if you get to the stage that they're swollen and they're months down the line, then it's very unlikely that no matter what you do, you'll get that swelling to come down and it becomes a normal leg again. So sometimes that is kind of what you're left with um, and, and that you have to accept that really. Okay. Thank you. And I suppose leading on from there, we've had a question, mud fever to wash or to not wash the legs? <laughs> Another surprisingly <laughs> tricky yep. question. Um, I think it's so hard, isn't it? I think also we we're discussing clipping as well. Um, I think it depends on the environment the horse lives in. If they are in really wet conditions 24-7, um, I think, yes, that is going to predispose them to mud fever. So if they are out in the day and in at night, I think there's a bit of a, a couple of camps between washing, hosing the legs off to get the mud and dirt and debris off and letting them dry, or whether you let the mud dry and brush it off. But I suppose sometimes that can just sort of work it in and be irritant. I feel like it can depend a bit on the horse and the environment that they're in. Um, I know that's not a very clear answer I think if they are the main thing is trying to get them to dry out so if they really are predisposed to getting mud fever they've had it lots I know it's not always easy for everybody depending on what yards you're on but 
getting them just off the mud and letting them dry out a bit naturally giving them a break from having wet skin I think that can help and if they have cellulitis treating it as Evita's described um but I appreciate it sometimes circumstances are that they, they can't come in um so I think sometimes clipping the legs can sometimes help to see what's going on if they've had a problem and then they will dry out quicker more naturally as well and less likely to be holding moisture kind of close to the skin all the time and I think you can see new lesions appear depending what you wash the legs with as well I wouldn't advise using hippie scrub too often and if you do use it very dilute sort of like a cap full in a litre of water um because that can dry the skin out as well um so I appreciate that's it's a complicated one isn't it because it's not straightforward to say yes or no um I think if your horse doesn't have a problem hasn't had a problem with mud fever I wouldn't worry too much about whether they dry naturally or hose them off I think carry on as you are but if they have had issues I think trying to get the legs to dry out like maybe they need to come in for a bit if that's possible yeah difficult situation <laughs> Um, staying on the leg theme, um, Evita, um, my horse, what do I do if my horse has come in with a nail in its foot? Call us. <laughs> 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 um, so a nail in the foot can be quite disastrous for a horse if it's going in a direction that it shouldn't have gone and if it's affecting structures within the foot and all those structures are awfully close. So if you do have, or if you do find your horse with a nail in the foot, try to keep the horse where it is. Um, when you found it. So try not to move it hundreds of yards towards its stable because the more it walks on the foot with that nail in place, the more damage it can potentially do. Um, and then, uh, and as I said, collars, I do mean that. I do think you have to have a vet come out and have a look at it because it would be very beneficial for us to see the horse when the nail is in place because then we can have a better idea of where the nail is going and take some radiographs um, if possible as well so we can see and identify which direction it's going in. If because of circumstances that's not possible and you do have to move the horse, then I would take the nail out, make sure you keep it so you know exactly, so you can show us what kind of nail it is and how deep it went in. Make sure you mark on the foot where it went in, so you because it's amazing how quickly that little hole will close up. So by the time we get there, it might be that it's closed up and it can be quite tricky to find. So if you can mark where you took it out, um, and then after the nail is removed, move your horse to a dry place, a stable or anywhere on concrete. Um, and then we can come and have a look at the horse and see if it would require anything else. Again, it can be a life-threatening injury if it's not treated appropriately. So um, some of them don't necessarily have any consequences. But as I said, there's a lot of structures in the foot that are very close to the ground that are very easily punctured by a nail that's can potentially do quite well if they're treated appropriately within a, a, a time for aim of, 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 a, of a day's time. If you wait too long and you wait until the horse is actually lame, then we're kind of chasing our tail, trying to get things under control. So you're better off getting us sooner rather than later. Super, that's great, thank you. Um, Tim, another question that's come in. My horse coughs on hay and brings up some phlegm, even when soaked, but it's fine on haylage. He doesn't cough when it's dusty or dry outside and has never coughed when he's ridden. Can some horses just not tolerate hay? Okay, so the, this, if the horse is coughing when exposed to dry hay, then it's almost certainly got a form of asthma. Um, and which and asthma is most commonly an allergy um, to mold spores that are in hay, hay and straw dust and stable dust generally. And just like people with asthma, they, they can vary from a really mild nuisance to a serious condition. And if the horse isn't very sensitive, then it may just be dry hay that sparks it off. Um, whereas horse age, which is vacuum packed, doesn't have mold growing in it, doesn't have the same fungal species growing in it. Um, so it, it will be a lot cleaner as far as that horse goes and it won't therefore expose the horse to the, the mold spores. And depending on how sensitive the horse is, he may or may not cough during exercise. Some horses produce discharge, nasal, like a mucus discharge during exercise or at other times. Some horses are very clever at swallowing all that mucus, so you never see it come out of the nose. 
uh, but it's almost certainly that this horse is going to have a, a, some, a, a low degree of sensitivity or asthma. Um, so keeping it off dry hay is probably the most effective thing to do. You can also soak the hay to dampen down the mold spores. So soaking the hay doesn't get rid of the mold spores, it simply dampens it down. So when the horse eats it, it doesn't create a cloud of dust, which they end up in the hail. And I suppose slightly leading on from that, I've um, got a question that my horse won't tolerate inhalers. Are there any other options? So the management of horses with asthma, yeah. So basically the most important thing is the environmental management to make sure it's not exposed to the, the dust that causes the symptoms of asthma. Um, so having it out as much as possible, good ventilation is stable, don't use dry straw bedding, avoid dry hay and so on. Uh, that's the, the most important thing about managing asthma and coughing horses. If you need drugs, and we try and reserve drugs for the more serious cases because we don't want to use them unless we need to, then there are two main classes of drugs. One is the corticosteroids, which are anti-inflammatory drugs. They're the most potent anti-inflammatory drugs, and asthma is an inflammatory disease of the lungs and the airways. And, and bronchodilators, which are drugs which open up the airways. Both of these types of drugs can be given by inhalation. So you get the horse to breathe in the drug and they then get straight down into the airways where they need to work. But that depends on the horse tolerating the, that actual process of giving the drug. So the other option is to give the drug either by injection or in the feed. And, and again, you can treat, you can use both of these drugs in that form. So that both drugs can be given by, by mouth, uh, by putting in the feed. So they will be either corticosteroids or bronchodilators. But as I say, the most important thing is to try and tackle the management and the environment that the horse is in. Because in a lot of cases, you can manage this disease purely doing that and you don't have to use drugs at all. Thanks, Tim. Um, Amy, yeah. um, another question. Please, can you advise when I should be testing my horse for tapeworm and how often? So I think we generally advise to test once a year in the autumn. Um, it's a saliva test that you have to hold in the corner of the horse's mouth until it turns pink. I've learned that as well. So um, testing once a year and then that comes up with, I think it's mild, moderate, moderate to severe, high result. And um, that will then guide us as to whether or not we need to treat for tapeworm. As far as I'm aware, there's only combined wormers for tapeworm now. Um, so we want to ensure to reduce resistance that we're treating appropriately. And when if we can test for it, that's fantastic. And then we know we're only treating the cases that have come back with a, a high um, tapeworm saliva test. Um, for those who don't do saliva testing, because not everybody does, I think once a year in the autumn. Um, but I'm open to ideas of Tim. What do you think? Would you say once or twice a year? It's a good question because nobody actually knows, to be honest. And it's some people say twice a year, some people say once a year, but there's no good evidence. Uh, we, we tend to go once a year because we take worms aren't a massive problem. They are a problem, but in some, certainly in some studs, uh, with lots of young stock, tapeworms can be a big, big problem. And in those situations, it's probably sensible to test twice a year because they're, they're likely to be exposed to a much higher burden of tapeworm. But once a year for most horses is, is, should be fine. And then leading on from that question, um, another question is how often should I be doing faecal airworm egg counts as well? Is that for me or...? <laughs> Don't I'm, mind, Amy. I'm happy. <laughs> um, so we recommend doing faecal worm egg count every three months. Um, so that way we're just keeping an idea. It's, it's good to identify the species of worms that the horses are carrying. Um, it can be, it's not always the most reliable test in terms of burden because sometimes they can shed intermittently, but it really gives us a good idea for each individual horse of you know what types of parasites we're treating. Um, roughly kind of what sort of burdens we're looking at in that population of horses on that premises. Um, so I think it is really good data to have and it is helpful sometimes for individuals. So sometimes we see a sudden peak in a certain parasite and I think that can be very good to guide our decisions and when we worm them and when we don't. And the main aim of faecal worm egg count testing as well is to reduce unnecessary worming. Um, to reduce resistance to the drugs that we use because we've only got a few 
and as far as you know I don't think they've created any new drugs just yet so we do have to be careful not to overuse them and I think a lot more people now are, are on board with fecal worm egg counts which is great and it's very easy just a bit of poo give it to us we'll do the rest <laughs> um great um another one maybe for evita um just about hospitalizations and um and cost of horses but someone has asked you know is it important that i do get my horse insured well that depends on what you're trying to get out of it to be honest so somebody once told me that you only insure for situations that you don't expect so most of the times that means that that situations you get yourself in that are going to be costly. And if you don't have the funds for that, then yes, you should probably consider insurance. So insurance is very beneficial because um, it's on, again, it depends on your personal situation. But if that is the idea behind it, because the cost of treating a horse can become quite um, high if you're thinking about things like colic surgery or wounds that require um, more than a, a stitch up they require for instance more lavage under under general anesthesia more extensive treatment longer durations of antibiotics um, and a wound for instance is easily obtained by most horses and a wound that goes into a joint or any other structure that might need more aggressive treatment is quite easy as well just because of the way that they're built um, and if you would think about an acute wound like that that would require treatment in a hospital setting under general anesthesia with five days of antibiotics you would on average be looking at somewhere between the three and a half and four and a half thousand pounds um, and that is a significant amount of money so it depends a little bit on where you sit there if some people would choose to just put money aside every month and have a pot of money that they can pay for situations like that if you don't want to do that or you choose not to do that, then I think insurance can be very beneficial. The thing that you have to keep in mind with insurance is, is for emergency situations, I think it can really be helpful. For other situations such as more elective procedures, um, it can be immensely helpful as well because they, they can be costly. Lameness examinations can become quite costly if it takes a lot of diagnostics or treatments to either get to the other end of it. Um, other things like, I mean, Tim knows more about that, but things like um, tumors, sarcoids, things that are quite common um, can sometimes become quite expensive to treat. So and an insurance company can, can help with fielding the bill on that. What you have to remember and what I think is what a lot of people would get disgruntled about is that once it has been noticed by a veterinarian that your horse has that problem, you're, even if you do not submit a claim to the insurance company um, um, about that specific injury, if it's noted in our records, then that is actually when your one year time frame starts to deal with the situation. So the insurance company will either pay for one year since the injury was first noticed, or they will pay for the amounts that you're insured for. And that is something that I think a lot of people don't always realize. So let's say that we've looked at your horse and it's been shown to be right hind limb lame. Um, but then there were no further investigations and nine months down the line that lameness gets worse and then more investigations would be required. You only have three months time to figure it out. So that time frame is quite important to realize. And I think a lot of people don't always know that. Um, but again, that is the that is the terms and conditions of the insurance company. So that is what you're getting yourself into if you sign up with them. So they have lots of benefits, I think, especially since the cost of treating horses can be quite expensive. Um, and if you don't have a pot of money on the side, which most people don't, then I think insurance company can help save your horse at that point in time. Thanks, Avita. I suppose continuing on a slightly non-clinical role, um, perhaps Tim, as you've been here for the longest, um, could answer this one. Um, how do you think Bella's changed since um, becoming a corporate? Okay, so um, yeah, there's, I would start by saying I think there's a lot of nonsense talked about this corporatization and whether it's good and bad or bad and whether independent practices are better. Um, like most things in life there are pros and cons. 
And the cons from the veterinary point of view, if you're working a, enough for a corporate, is that you can't buy into the business. You're, you're, you're an employee. There's no way that you can become a, a business owner. If you want to be a business owner, you'd have to work in an independent practice and buy into it um, and become a partner in the tr kind of traditional James Herriot way of running practices. The, the, you hear a lot of people saying, oh, corporates are just out from making money. Um, but of course, every veterinary practice, apart from the charities, are there to make money. They have to make money in order to pay their staff and in order to invest in the, in the practice and all the equipment and everything they need to keep up to date and to provide the best service. And vets are vets, whether they work in a corporate or an independent practice, and they're there to try and help animals and their owners and they're exactly the same species of person of vet in both sides of the of the pond um so the the advantages of being in a, as part of a corporate is that um you're part of a very big group and therefore you 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 can bounce ideas and services between the different practices within the group the group the corporates have have good buying power they can negotiate better deals with drug companies and the people selling equipment which means they can then pass that saving on to the clients and also invest better possibly better in some of the practices um, so that's a, a good positive of being a part of a corporate group um, they also do a lot of good in terms of supporting vets uh, and new graduates. Now, that's not to say that independents don't do the same, but they probably have, again, a bit easier for them to support, especially younger vets coming into the profession. Um, and remember that vets are under a lot of stress. It's a stressful job. Uh, and mental health problems are big in the vet in the veterinary world. Suicide rates in vets is high compared to most other uh, professions and the general public. Uh, so supporting vets and uh, giving them a good work-life balance is really important. Uh, and corporates can achieve that a lot easier than in independence in most cases. Um, so uh, as far as what's happened at Bell, I don't think it's really changed our ethos or what we're here to do. We're all here to provide a good service and uh, hopefully a value for money service. Um, in some respects, it makes it easier easier for us to do that now than before. Um, it, it takes away a lot of the backroom work, the sort of management and stuff that, that most vets don't want to do anyway. That can be passed on to the head office. So it gives us more time to do the sort of work that most vets want to do. Thanks, Tim. I think we probably all agree. Um, Amy, if we go back to more of the clinical side. Mm -hmm. um, any tricks for giving my horse some oral medication? Okay, yeah, so I know that can be difficult. Um, I think also when your vet is there in the yard, if your horse doesn't like eating something, let us know, because then we can start having a discussion when we're there about how to get the medication in. Um, we can give you a dosing syringe. So you can syringe the medications directly in. Now I do also appreciate some of them don't like being syringed either, but that's why it's good to kind of have a chat with the vet when we're there. Um, so they can put it in a, bit, a little bit of food. I usually would recommend putting medications just in a small feed before their main feed so you know that they've eaten it and, and it's not kind of swamped by a, a huge bucket of food. Um, so you can use things like a bit of apple juice sometimes, something that smells sweet. Horses do have a bit of a sweet tooth. If your horse is on a diet and they're not allowed sugar, I do appreciate it can be a little bit more tricky. Um, so some medications like Prescend, they don't always like to eat because it's quite bitter. Um, but I think they are allowed like a bit of carrot or something in that instance to get the medication in. Um, but yes, yeah, I think the main advice, things like antibiotics and beet when they're on a course for sort of, you know, five days, I think trying to syringe the medication in if they're not eating it is probably the best way to ensure they're getting the right dose um, at appropriate intervals. Um, but always just let us know if they're not eating something they don't like, if you're having trouble getting medication in, tell us, because then we can change the course. And sometimes if they really won't eat something and it's really important that they are you know, needing medication, like with cellulitis, they might need to go into intravenous or intramuscular injections, but we can discuss that at the time rather than you know, taking time and money 
wasting drugs that they're not eating. Um, it's always worth having a chat with one of us about it. Thanks, Amy. Um, Evita, um, just on lame this one with a cut leg. So my horse has cut his leg, but how do I know if I need to call the vet out? Um, in general, if the skin is fully cut through, you should probably have it checked out because it can be in a location that is actually cut into regions that are more important, like tendons and ligaments and joints. Um, so if it is just an abrasion, so the skin is still intact, like they've shaved themselves, a lot of those um, you will probably be fine treating them or just giving us a call and we can talk you through that, um, but treating them with some ointment and, and monitoring those. I think when the skin is fully breached, then it depends a lot on the location where it is as to whether or not it would need further treatment. Um, and that can be quite tricky for me to tell you that in two minutes, which locations are serious and which are not. Um, so I think if the skin is fully breached, give us a call and then we can talk through it and then we can decide at that time whether or not we think it's in a location that it's safe to wait or you can send us a picture that usually is quite helpful as well. Um, and if we think that we need to address it further than we can. So it depends a lot on where you find the wound and how deep it goes. So I suppose following on from that, um, another question we've had is um, sometimes vets won't dispense antibiotics over the phone. Can you explain why that is? Um, well, I think we dispense antibiotics when we think the horse requires it. So a lot of the times if... A lot of the times if we get told about the symptoms, especially if our pictures associated with it, then we might make a judgment call to say what well, this horse would require additional treatment, but it doesn't necessarily have to be seen by us. Um, but it does need to be treated more than what it's currently treated with. So antibiotics can be appropriate in that case. We would never dispense antibiotics, I think, without, or at least I would never, and I assume nobody else does either, without having that conversation and potentially having pictures of the leg or whatever is going on at that point in time. So we do need to make a judgment call on whether or not we think the horse needs a visit. Um, if we think with the information that we have that the horse doesn't need a visit but does require additional treatment, then it can be that we say, okay, we don't necessarily have to come, but you do need to pick up these antibiotics. And then we would usually follow up with a phone call the next day um, to make sure that everything is going in the right direction. Um, so to some degree, um, again, you don't, it's the same as currently, I think a lot of GPs would act the same way. Like a lot of the times you will get a phone consultation and you will be guided in the same direction. You don't always need that face-to-face -face contact, I think. Would anybody have any like, other yeah, thoughts no, on The that? other thing to say is it, legally we're not allowed to prescribe antibiotics unless we know the case and we are sure that antibiotics are required. Yeah. Um, and there was a big, big problem with antibiotic resistance now, as I'm sure everybody is aware. I think I'm right in saying that in 2020, uh, there were about, in England alone, about 1,200 people died purely because of antibiotic resistant infections. It's a growing, growing problem in human medicine. Uh, and antibiotics given to animals and humans can spread between animals and humans. So it's really vitally important that we reduce to a minimum the use of antibiotics and only use them when they're absolutely necessary. Um, so, and choosing the right antibiotic, the right dose, the right duration of treatment are really, really important in trying to reduce the problem of resistance. Um, because if nothing's done, there are no new antibiotics on the horizon. If certainly for, for horses, it's, we're not gonna get any new antibiotics. So as resistance becomes a bigger, bigger problem, which every year it is, um, our kind of our armory of, of drugs to treat infections is, is getting smaller and smaller. Thanks, Tim. Um, we've probably only got another kind of five minutes left, so we might just kind of end up with another couple of questions. Um, one of them is, um, is there a new vaccine for sweet itch, perhaps, Amy? Um, yeah, so there has been um, a ringworm vaccine being used to help manage sweet itch but 
I think the important thing, a um, bit like with asthma, is management is really, really important with these horses because they're so sensitive to that midgy bite. Um, so although I think the vaccine is successful in about 30, 33% of cases. So I feel like it's only really appropriate for the ones where there's really, really good control. So really good fly management, um, really full cover fly rugs, including hoods and masks, um, applying DSACT once or twice a week. So that's the um, fly spray, basically. And um, really trying not to turn them out near standing water and dusk and dawn at these times of day when their midges are at their worst. Um, and introducing things like, you know, if they can have a windy field, midges don't like wind when they're in the stable, if it's possible to provide some sort of netting or mesh to prevent them getting into the stable or even a fan if they'll tolerate it. So just creating an environment where they will reduce being bitten by the midge. So that will be the best treatment in the way is prevention. Um, for some of those cases that are really struggling to cope, the uh, um, incel vaccine has been used. I should say as well, it is not very easy to get a hold of. So I think as a practice, we have a wait list often. It's not the cheapest vaccination. Um, so hence why we would always discuss about all the management because you can do a lot with management. So even if it's not an option for you to do the vaccine, um, there's certainly, you know, we can have lots of discussions about how to manage a horse with sweet itch. Um, and we're always happy to talk about that. Great, thank you. Um... So just going back to these questions on here, so um, Tim or Evita, what is the success rate of colic surgery? Do horses survive the general anaesthetic? Do they colic again? Um, and then are they put to sleep? All of that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, the, the trouble is there's, there's 101 reasons why a horse can get colic and each of those diseases has a slightly different sort of outlook and prognosis. Overall, around about 80%, 85% maybe of horses that have colic surgery will survive and go home. Um, some of them at the time of surgery, the disease is in inoperable, it's too far gone, or there's too much uh, bowel damaged, um, in which case they may have to be put down on the table. So, and there is a complication rate from colic surgery. Some horses do well after colic surgery, a small smaller proportion don't do well and have various complications that can arise. Um, but the overall success rate array is around about 80%. So yeah, one in five won't make it. Um, there is a risk in some horses, a proportion horses that have colic surgery will be more prone to getting colics afterwards when they go home. The recovery time is a couple of months after colic surgery and they need to be carefully managed during that period. And if um, one of the problems with any abdominal surgery in horses, just as it is in humans, is you get adhesions, so scarring in the abdomen. And that can, if you're unfortunate, lead to further bouts of colic. Um, so in the majority of horses, they do fine, but a, a smaller proportion will have problems. But it does depend to a large degree on how, what the underlying disease was in the first place, because I say there's lots of different types of colic and lots of different parts of the intestine that can be affected. And depending on what that is, that affects the outlook. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Evita, um, someone has said, Evita, you diagnosed my, my pony Paddy last year with spondylitis and arthritis. Sadly, he deteriorated and was put to sleep. What causes this condition as there's nothing about it online? You may remember him for his great aim. <laughs> um, arthritis, so spondyl spondylosis, I think, is what we would be talking about, um, which nobody really knows why horses get that. Um, arthritis is, again, it's a very, I mean, everybody, every species gets arthritis. So it's a joint disease that damages the joint in the longer term and creates pain. Now, it can 
the, the whole process is an inflammatory process that can be started by different pathways. So one of them, the two main pathways would be an acute traumatic incident. So if you have an acute trauma to the joint, like a twist and a turn, getting stuck in a fence, doing something bad to a joint that overstretches it and traumatizing it, um, can start the whole pathway of arthritis. And arthritis is a progressive disease that you cannot stop. The other pathway is um, a wear and tear kind of injury. So if horses do quite a bit of mileage, um, then they can wear and tear on their joints, just like people and dogs and everybody else does. Um, and arthritis is started because of that. So those are the two main pathways. And sometimes it's very difficult to find out which one it was. Yeah, because you don't always know. The bottom line is the end result is the same, is that you have a damaged joint. And the joint that is damaged, you can't fix. So you can't cure the disease. You can manage the pain associated with the disease. You can try to stop the disease from getting worse and worse and worse by doing specific modifications, specific medications. But the bottom line is it is a progressive disease and all we can do is manage the pain and try to slow down the progression. Sometimes the disease is too far gone. So if you have a really badly damaged joint and it doesn't matter what kind of medications you give the horse, it hurts. And if it hurts at some point, you have to say, if we can't manage the pain, this is not fair. Um, and sometimes you can manage them and you can keep them comfortable to be comfortable retired. And sometimes you can manage them that they can be comfortable being ridden. It depends on the, the amount of, disease that is going on in the joints and it depends on the horse it depends on what kind of job the horse has etc etc so there's a lot of complicating factors but the bottom line is is that it is a disease that we cannot fix so all we can do is try to manage the horses and sometimes we're more successful in managing them than other times it depends on how much damage there has been done and how much pain is associated with the damage Thanks, Avita. And um, again, sorry to hear about Paddy. Um, more of a medical question, um, maybe towards Amy or Tim, but why do we get seasonal change in hormone variation with Cushing's disease? It's, a, it's a, natural, <laughs> a natural response to Yeah, why? Right. <laughs> um, so it, it relates to the, the hormones that come out of the the pituitary gland and it's 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 normal every horse has this variation during the um, spring and autumn uh, so that makes it uh, in terms of Cushing's disease which is, I guess is uh, what's getting at um, this actually makes the autumn time a good time to do the test because you, you get an exaggerated um, level of hormones in in disease state if that makes sense and leading on from that, there's just a question about um, Cushing's and just whether it's more common nowadays amongst horses and ponies and, and what causes it? Um, I think we're just better at diagnosing it these days. I think owners as well and vets, I think, are really good at just uh, noticing really early signs. So sometimes they're urinating more or they've just started to become lethargic or they've noticed the muscle has changed, they've dropped a bit of condition. So I think we're it's so easy to diagnose. We can take a blood sample when we're on the yard. Um, and so I wouldn't, I don't think it's more common. I think it's just more commonly diagnosed. Um, and it's it's caused um, by the pituitary gland enlarging. So in some cases they can have more severe clinical signs than others, but it is a progressive disease of the pituitary. So once they have it, it, it won't be reversible, but we can manage it really well with medication and keeping an eye on their um, ACTH levels it's the blood test that we do so I think it is common I think probably in the past it was probably just old horse was just old whereas now we can actually sort of maybe diagnose them with Cushing's and, and treat them for it and they can go back to looking younger again. <laughs> Super. Um, I think we'll just have so one more question um, before we finish and uh, maybe one for Tim but melanomas should I um, leave or should I treat? Treat. <laughs> <laughs> Why? So, okay, so the first thing to say, melanomas in horses are different to melanoma in people and dogs. In people and dogs, they're usually really nasty and they spread horribly. Melanomas in horses can do this, um, but they don't normally do that straight away. 
as a horse gets older, a horse with melanoma, you get more and more likely that that melanoma will turn nasty. So every horse that has a melanoma has a potential cancer there. So although initially they're usually benign lumps, um, over time they get bigger and over time they get more likely to become cancerous, which means they can spread. And once they spread, you, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so for that reason, we've kind of changed our view over the last 10, 20 years. Previously, we all said, well, every grey horse gets a melanoma, live with it. But when the horses are tending to live old, into older age now, just like people are, and that's one of the reasons why we, we see more, potentially could see more Cushing cases as well, because they're living older and Cushing's is a disease of older horses. So if you leave them, two things happen. One, they get bigger, and the bigger they are, the more difficult they are to treat. And two, they're more likely to become cancerous and they'll spread. So we've changed our view on this. We now suggest that melanomas are treated when they're small, get rid of them as, as, as if you possibly can. It's easier said than done in some horses because some horses will develop loads and loads of them. Uh, and some horses develop melanomas in areas that you can't easily treat, such as the throat latch region. Uh, they're not easily treated at all. So there are the melanomas under the tail around the back end, I would mostly suggest taking them off as soon as they appear. Melanomas, otherwise, the only other treatment is the using the, the is a vaccine. But the jury's out over this vaccine. It's quite expensive and it doesn't seem to work in every horse, but it, in the proportion, probably 50%, it does something. It either slows them down or if you're really lucky, it might reduce the size of the melanomas, but it's not like to get rid of them completely. So the advice is treat them if you can. Great. Input? No, I think so, I'm okay. happy. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you, Tim. I think that's probably going to be um, as much as we're going to do tonight. I think we've hopefully answered any of the questions that have been submitted. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. We really appreciate it. And we will probably hold another one of these um, in the spring. Um, if you do have any more questions, we're always here to chat in the day as well. And finally, we'd just like to say thank you to our speakers, so to Tim, Evita and to Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.